arrived at 13.5 degrees north and 60.58 degrees west with 26 inches of rain and winds exceeding 90 miles per hour. The date, October 30th, 2010. Listed as a Category 2, it snuffed eight lives. Its name, Hurricane Tomas. Countless schools, roads, bridges, farms and homes were decimated. When the skies cleared up, it left the Helen of the West in 336.15 million US dollars of debt. On December 24, 2013, Tomas's baby brother, a low-level trough perched over St. Lucia for just over three hours, and within that short period, it deposited 224 millimeters of rainfall, a one in 100 year event. The physical and economic loss totaled 99.8 million US dollars. Ancillary, Canaries, Mark Bexon, Viewfort, and Souffre were the hardest hit. The Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project came into effect on November 13th, 2014. Seeing the devastation caused by hurricanes, more as a result of global warming and climate change. Um, after we experienced Hurricane Thomas and all of the damages that was done, the government began the negotiating process um, to access funds to build resilience. Um, because we believe that in moving forward, there was the need to build better and to build more resilient, expecting that as we go along, you would get more intense hurricanes and natural disasters. Some primary concerns. One is that we're expecting to see an increase in the frequency of the most intense hurricanes. So those are category three, category four, and category five hurricanes, and that's due to the increased warming of the Earth's um, average temperature where, and the ocean temperature as well. We're also expecting to see changes in rainfall patterns so that we see more extremes. So on one hand, we expect to have more frequent and intense flood events, and on the other hand, more frequent and intense droughts. The third factor, which is of extreme significance for small islands like St. Lucia, is that there's also a rise in global sea level. And on a best, in a best case scenario, this might be as much as a foot rise by the end of this century compared to what sea level was in the year 2000. But under worst case scenarios, it might be even beyond eight foot rise by the end of this century compared to what sea level was in the year 2000. So you can just imagine the impacts for an island like St. Lucia where we have so much invested in that narrow low lying coastal zone. There's also just the average increase again in air and ocean temperatures, which is, which is driving these other changes, but also has impacts of its own. So for example, impacts on a number of natural ecosystems like coral reefs, which bleach under warmer than average temperatures. Also health implications, like an increase in the incidence of certain vector-borne diseases like dengue fever. So the DVRP is concerned with how do we build resilience or reduce the vulnerability to all of these varied impacts of climate change and how do we do it in a very comprehensive, holistic manner. Ten years after the passage of Hurricane Tomas, the scars are still tattooed in several parts of St. Lucia with massive land slippage and infrastructural damage which have remained unattended for a decade. This area here was one of numerous slides around the island that affected the infrastructure, the road infrastructure of St. Lucia. And since then, the funding has been made available through the DVRP to rebuild this wall, considering that this road is one of the critical links 
uh, part of the secondary road systems of, of St. Lucia. The contract for the rehabilitation works in Bacatel and Forrester was awarded to Fresh Start Construction Company through a competitive bidding process to the tune of 2 million EC dollars. The official contract was signed on November 27th. By December the 4th, construction was well on the way. What we're constructing here is actually a reinforced concrete cantilevered retaining wall. First of all, we start with the excavation. We're trying to achieve a suitable bearing strata for that wall. Um, it's been exposed there for a while, so there's a bit of water beneath the soil, but hopefully we should get a proper bearing for that. After which we will blind, followed by reinforcement for the footing, form work, and we'll be pouring concrete to cast that foot in today. Uh, the particular type of wall that's been put there will be a 16-inch thick retaining wall. It's been designed specifically for that type of stabilization. Once fully cast, the forms will be removed, the site will be backfilled and compacted. This will then allow the contractors to lay a surface of asphalt on this repaired landslippage site. Naturally, this undertaking had its own challenges. Traffic for one. Uh, we've been managing the traffic, but everyone still wants to come through here. People are ignoring the signs. We've run it through the media. We've put up all proper signage, but people still want to come through. But we have to send them back for health and safety reasons. We can't allow them to pass. Similarly, a land slippage in forest there which had been left unattended for over 10 years, is now simultaneously under construction. Forest here project is more or less similar to this. So what we're doing there, we're first erecting a reinforced concrete wall, followed by a concrete road on top of there, and it will have concrete drains. That should take care of the water issue that caused the landslide in the first place. The wall burst oh, at the back by the river there. Next contract are there. Where at? Where at? Where at? Flooding in certain parts of St. Lucia is seasonal and perennial. Castries, Denry, Ancillary, Marsha and Bexo are key flood zones. Every time the river gets like polluted and it's garbage and thing, especially in this time, rain time, right, it's turning all in the yard there, the water has been like over the bridge, even that bridge we're sitting on right now. Country Village is a community off the Bexton Highway with approximately 100 residents. They are scarred by Mother Nature's annual assaults with the Bexhall River and the lack of proper drainage exacerbating the problem. The water was so high, it was up to that bit about right there. See that bit right there? You can take a boat and ride through the front on it. The little houses was covered. We cannot leave our home and go through the main road. They had flooding everywhere. You see the last step of my house there? They have water right up to there. You see that boy house? But right by the window, those flood. Mm -hmm. All these people had it was taking a little shelter. Three of the main ways to reduce flooding are one, leave river plains undeveloped. Two, improve community drainage using culverts, concrete drains, and other types of drainage solutions, such as stormwater retention basins, engineered to handle heavy rainfall events. And three, the silt rivers which now suffer from increased sediment flows caused by degradation of our river systems and surrounding forest. The Marsha River threatens residents annually. But through the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project's intervention, Marshall residents can breathe a sigh of relief. Currently, we are defilting the part of the Marshall River, the main river, and uh, between Marshall to Wavin to Twelve. Typically, without it being um, desilted, it would have so much debris 
coming down throughout the the lifespan the year that it was not disrupted you'd have tree trunks um garbage and stuff that would block up certain parts of the river um, and for us to be able to 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 prevent flooding and blocking of the rivers and going over the bridges and stuff like that the rivers has to be desilted the desilting of the marsha and mark rivers was funded by the dvrp but when rivers threaten homes in low-lying areas ingenious methods of property protection must be employed you had some flooding and embankment erosion and um, persons uh, persons houses were being threatened so you find when the river is coming down it would erode this embankment here and then jump the embankment and flood out these well these two houses and houses lower down because if you notice the person had to end up putting that's elevated wall to the front of their property and also their staircase to get away from the flood um, the embankment was a lot further out and over the years it has been eroded. So what we came in to do was to, to, to line the embankment with some boulders to create a bit of a hard protection area so that the water would not erode that embankment anymore and more or less control the flow going back out. The Mark River snakes through the Bexon community. Every year, several homes along its banks are flooded. Over $4 million was invested into flood mitigation works in this highly susceptible area. This culvert crossing was taking water from the entire Sandy Fay Chopin Ridge and quite a bit of water comes off that, 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 that catchment. And as a result of that, um, this area was constantly flooded out, especially the homes lying in the drain going back to the river. So having been aware of that, we came in and we did a complete drainage system for this area where we installed a fully concrete lined drain from this culvert crossing all the way back to the main Bexar River. Flooding can never totally be solved. And over the years, millions of dollars have been spent in the Bexar region in this pursuit. With the help of DVRP funding, the new drainage system was designed to accommodate a flow of 250 to 500 millimeters of water per hour. To put that into perspective, Typical rainfall intensities during Tropical Storm Debbie was 100 to 150 millimeters per hour. Over a three-month period, a total of 287 meters of drains were constructed in Country Village. We in the community, we build a drain. I was part of the work. I was still better than all the still work. I did all the still need drain there. Most of the workers came from the community. Um, persons who are unemployed um, due to COVID now most of us are out of jobs so it has helped a lot. Well I was given a, a small job to do one of the drains in the area. Um, it really helped given the fact that I'm unemployed and um, it helped sustain, sustain my family for a little while. On November the 7th 2020 St. Lucia was drenched with 8.5 millimeters of rainfall within a 12-hour period. And predictably, swollen rivers caused flooding in many parts of the island, especially in Bexon. The country village community, however, was unscathed. And we see a good improvement in it. It wasn't flood at all. So you can see the work was very good. Didn't real flood here again. It just came up to a, and went back down because of the, the construction of the drains, the water was flowing a little better. But since they build the drain, there yeah, is no flood here. Nothing flood here as well. No, no flood here. Although we had a couple of rain, other places flooding, but around here, there was no flood here. The main objective of the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project is to reduce vulnerability to natural hazards and climate change impacts in St. Lucia through investment in resilient infrastructure and improve hazard data collection and monitoring systems. The DVRP is funded with resources provided by the World Bank, Climate Investment Funds, the European Union and the Government of St. Lucia. The DVRP has committed funding for flood mitigation works in Denry South, Miku, Ancillary, Mondo Millet, Canaries, 
Palmis in Soufre, Café and Myers Bridge. Well, I'd like to say a big thank you to them. That's the, the, um, they stepped in and helped us out because before that we really wondered if we would have gotten help. So I would like to say a big thank you and they have done a great job. When you have two, three hundred people living in an area at every rainy season gets flooded two or three times where all the appliances in their homes, um, their beds, their clothes, the, the discomfort sometimes in the middle of the night. When you can do a simple drainage project that would reduce the level of flooding as we have seen in so many communities within my constituency, then this speaks volume. For me, that is what the project of DVRP is intended to do. It is to reduce the impact of flooding, natural disasters on the everyday people. The Denry village, which is below sea level, is at the mercy of intense coastal waters, as well as the tributaries of rivers that encircle the low-lying settlement. The village is easily overwhelmed by flash floods during a bout of inclement weather. Because of the smell of the mud, I took, I said there's flooding. I call them, tell them, try and see what they can lift up to put in the house because the water was coming in like it's the sea that was there. If I did not realize it, it would be very, very terrible and bad in the house. This is an all too familiar story in Denry South. Downpour, high tide, poor drainage, and a village at the mercy of Mother Nature. I'm the parliamentary rep. When it rains in Denry, I can't sleep. Okay? Much less the, the, the individuals who live in the low lying area. On October the 6th, 2010, Hurricane Thomas inundated the village of Denry. The flooding was aggravated not only by torrential downpour, but a very poor drainage system. Fast forward 10 years, same date, October 6, 2020, and Mother Nature returned with the same fury. Over 8 inches of rain and, predictably, a flooded village of over 5,000 residents. Sometimes the water will go inside of the shop. Um, I have goods and damage already for the sake of the flooding. Um, my freezers, I have to, I had to ask somebody to repair the freezer and some of the goods that sometimes I, if I buy, um, buy some goods, like today, tomorrow will flood, I have to throw the things. November 17th, 2020, the skies opened up and once again, Denry was a casualty community. The government of St. Lucia, with assistance from the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project, has embarked on an initiative to reduce the frequency of flooding in this region with a meticulously engineered drainage system. This drain where we are here now, it's coming from an area called Green Mountain. They stopped into it at one point up behind the school. And that is where most of the water coming down to the main drain is. So they have widened the capacity to take more because once it rains, as you see in the hill there, everything comes down for that trench. And you just have this little trench with the water pressure, it creates this lock. So nothing comes, comes out from the other side of the village. So until this subsides a little, then the other one carry. But now with what they're doing now, they have widened it and you have the turn. As it goes with the turn, so with the water pressure, both of them would be running parallel to each other. It picks it up and that should make a difference, a big difference. The drainage network is designed to efficiently channel stormwater into various water courses to accommodate up to a 1 in 25 year rainfall event. This system includes a series of interconnected open drains, slab drains and road culvert crossings totaling approximately 1,000 meters. On April 12, 2021, more than 114 millimeters of rainfall within a six-hour period, 
tested the engineering designs of the Denry Flood Mitigation Works. I'm impressed with what we've done and the performance. I did not expect at, at this stage for it to be performing so well. And um, what we can expect to see now is um, further improvements um, with the, the network. When it's completed, the idea is that we're going to, well, flooding should be, um, in the extreme events, you will see flooding. You cannot eliminate flooding, eh? let's get that right. Yeah, you can't, um, anywhere. But we can design for flood events that, um, that's reasonable, that comes every one in 20 years. Um, for the DVRP, we use one in 25 years. To date, several projects have been undertaken under the DVRP, including the retrofitting of four community centers, which have been specially designed as emergency shelters. Denry Village has a history of severe flooding during intense rainfall events. Not surprisingly, the former St. Peter Infant School had been severely affected by previously high rainfall events, including Tropical Storm Debbie in 1994 and flash flooding in 2010, Hurricane Tomas in 2010, and the 2013 Christmas Eve trough. The social and economic cost of returning the school to normalcy after such events is debilitating. In keeping with the mandate of the DVRP, $7.8 million was invested in a model smart school, complete with four classroom blocks built of reinforced concrete, concrete roof, storm shutters, storm drains, rainfall harvesting system, access for differently abled persons, energy efficient bulbs, water efficient toilets, and whiteboards. The new facility has been operational since December 2017, much to the delight of the Denry school community. The Sir Arthur Lewis Community College's Victor Archer Building, built in the 1800s and serving the Division of Art, Science and General Studies, was badly damaged by both Hurricane Tomas and the Christmas Eve trough. In the mid-2000s, we had a, an earthquake that damaged the building and in 2010, we also suffered further damage with Hurricane Tomas. We found that when it rained, that water will come through the roof, penetrate the upper floor and then come and disturb the classes. So, in effect, when it was raining, we could not have used this floor. In 2018, the building was decommissioned thus displacing and inconveniencing hundreds of students and faculty. The dean's office had to be moved. The admin offices who support the dean and serve the students also had to be moved. The building holds six large classrooms, many of them holding as many as 60 students. That also had to be moved. The Sir Arthur Lewis Community College made an official request for funding in May 2013 and this request was supported by central government. Designs and estimates were invited by local independent contractors. By May 2016, the bidding process commenced and the final designs were completed in March 2018. On June 1, 2020, contracts were signed to rehabilitate the over 200-year-old two-story Victor Archer building at a cost of 2.9 million EC dollars. Through a competitive bidding process, the contract was awarded to Mega Construction Inc. We have to install new ceilings. Um, the flooring is bad, so we have to redo those. Um, we have to give it a facelift in terms of the, 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 the aesthetics. We want to ensure that the building maintains the same appearance as the surrounding buildings. When complete, the Victor Archer building will consist of six large classrooms on the top floor inclusive of a language lab and an administrative office, whereas the ground floor will comprise three spacious classrooms, a small kitchen and a departmental archive. This project is expected to be complete by September 2021. What stands out for me now is the Schwazel Secondary School. Um, I think it's a flagship project under the DVRP. 
And the reason for this is because of everything that was done and the manner in which it was done. Um, we did go a little over the time period for the completion of the project, but a lot of the supplies that was required was not readily available. Um, there, there were challenges that, and as you would have with any project, you would have challenges, but this project really stands out for me as a major project, a major accomplishment on the, the DVRP program. The Miku Secondary School celebrated its 50th anniversary this year. It has an enrollment of 681 students. The physical deterioration of this aged plant came to a head on the first day of the new school year on September the 6, 2017. Teachers downed their tools. Students refused to enter the Form 3 block and they had the full support of the PTA. The Minister for Education, who is also the parliamentary representative for Miku North and a team of education officials visited to have a full grasp of the situation. It was the first day of school, the academic year 2017-2018, if I recall clearly, when in the usual fashion I would visit schools in my constituency. And when I visited the Mikud Secondary School and we toured the third form block, which was the block in contention in that particular year, I agreed with the teachers and students that that block was indeed in a deplorable condition. And in all good conscience, we could not house our students and teachers in that block. I remember making the bold decision that we should knock down the block. The next stage was comprehensive community consultation. We were pleased that the consultants listened to us. It started with um, the minister coming in, listening to the concerns, and of course, making a decision along with us to do something about the, 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 the condition of the school. I reiterated our commitment to building a smart school, albeit block by block. And by smart, what I mean is that it is technologically smart, energy smart, climate smart, and very importantly, that it is people smart, especially as we give consideration to students with um, different disabilities. Through a competitive bidding process, CIPAL Holdings Limited was awarded the $5.8 million contract to undertake this project within 15 months. Uh, this location is called a modern language classroom. We're moving on to the technical drawing classroom, which is here. Um, we have one more floor, which is the second floor, that we'll be uh, working on from next, from Monday next week. We'll be uh, Installing the bottom beams, then the, then the formwork for the floor itself to go up to the second floor. We also would have um, a visual arts classroom. We are looking forward to a um, clothing and textile room, an improved home economics room. We are looking forward to an improved um, building and uh, building technology room and the TD lab as well, so that our students can can basically feel that that learning is taking place. The school is expected to serve as an emergency shelter capable of providing continuity of service to approximately 700 students and 350 patrons during and within the aftermath of natural disasters. Within a three-year period, this project went from conceptualization to securing funding, finalizing designs and the commencement of construction a feat made possible through the special funding arrangements by the World Bank through the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project. Thirteen thousand four hundred and twenty-nine persons called Miku North and South home. These residents can now look forward to a state-of-the-art wellness center replacing a residential building which was configured to accommodate patients and provide healthcare services. Of necessity, we had to engage constituents, as I'm known to do for many of the projects that are undertaken in my constituency. But the consultation was ever more urgent because the quarrel 
about the location ensued. The DVRP, uh, officials, PCU, colleagues from the Ministry for Economic Development have been very, very supportive. One, to cure some of the encumbrances that were affiliated with that old structure because as you can appreciate, the World Bank would not continue with this project without curing some of the issues surrounding that facility. And I want to thank the Miku Mothers and Fathers Group for agreeing that whatever compensation was received, that that would go towards one, the completion of the ongoing Miku Presbytery and the fencing of the Miku Cemetery. On January 7th, 2020, the contract for the construction of the Miku Wellness Center was signed, heralding a new, modern era of healthcare for residents of Miku and neighboring communities. The construction of this wellness center is being funded and implemented through the government's Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project. Apart from the health facility serving the health needs of the community, we will recall that in cases of emergency, adverse weather systems or any other kind of disaster, it becomes a critical facility. So I'm happy to see the, the concurrence or the integration of several um, components. Not only is it an upgraded health facility in terms of the quality and the quantum of services to be provided, it is also uh, an infrastructurally smart and resilient building with respect to its ability to withstand high winds and other kinds of what we call natural disasters. It also reflects the extent to which we as a government have embraced the need for uh, renewable energy and to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, so it boasts of the embrace of that new technology. Construction phase started in January 9th, 2020. Um, they started with a, a full force. But then due to COVID, I think March, we had a shutdown for a month. We had some difficulties um, with materials, you know, COVID impacted materials as well. So the procurement of materials became an issue. And many times we had to probably slow down work as a result of this. Despite the challenges, there has been significant progress. As of May 2021, this 4,000 square feet modern health facility is near completion. Here is where all the dental works will be done, all right? This is where you come and sit in the nice big chair and you get the nice numbing drugs, okay? At the back here, we have a storage. This storage will only, will be only legalized or only be authorized by the dentist or the people working in this section. These little windows up here, we call them skylights or fixed light. These windows will take light from one room and jump into the next room to decrease the cost of electricity bill inside the building. In here we have what we call a pharmacy. So therefore you don't need to go down to view for to get your basic needs and basic drugs. You can also come here inside of Miku Wellness Center to get your drugs. This is the pharmacy, okay? This place will have a nice big sofa, a table of six chairs and also has, gonna have a TV, you know, and it has a male and female bathroom, fully equipped. The Miku Wellness Center was first proposed by John Compton in 1992. Today, $4.1 million in special funding from the World Bank through the DVRP will ensure that the facility is compliant with global standards for healthcare delivery and is designed to withstand climate change impacts. In March 2020, in anticipation of the COVID-19 pandemic and community spread, the government of St. Lucia proactively moved the operations of the 133-year-old Victoria Hospital to the OKEU Hospital. The government's team of engineers then got to work transforming these buildings into the island's full-fledged respiratory hospital. The design allows for segregated processing and treatment of patients with suspected and confirmed cases of COVID-19 
and even patients in different stages of treatment and recovery to ensure maximum patient care and safety. The World Bank provided 5.8 million EC dollars for the further expansion and transformation of the wards to specifically accommodate the possible influx of COVID patients. This included the increase in the number of beds, carpentry and joinery works, installation of partitions, plumbing works including installation of bathrooms, toilets and fixtures, sealing of floors, termites and mold treatment, external works, expansion of the septic tanks and associated drainage works, replacement of roofs and ceilings, and improvement in the ventilation, electrical and cooling systems, and painting of the exterior walls. The Environmental and Social Management Plan, which was published and can be accessed on the website of the Department of Finance, ensures that the retrofitting and rehabilitation works were done in compliance with national and regional environmental regulations and was consistent with international best practices and World Bank safeguard policies. Thankfully, central government's proactive approach, coupled with assistance from the DVRP with funding from the World Bank, has ensured that the 133-year-old hospital has been retrofitted to accommodate over 100 COVID-19 patients during the recovery phase. The Victoria Hospital Respiratory Facility is the region's only full-fledged COVID rehabilitation centre. But not all DVRP project implementation has been smooth sailing. The most challenging project for me so far has been the Denry Polyclinic. Um, in terms, um, that's a project that we actually went on ground. We had the groundbreaking ceremony and we were expecting in 18 months to have completed this project. And in, in my um, opening remarks, I did indicate to the contractor that we were going to hold them accountable to deliver the project within um, time and within budget. Um, but less than a month into the project, we ran into major challenges where there were defects with the design. The design did not meet a lot of the specifications and I'm still very puzzled as to how this could have happened because this is a design that went through all of the stages and for some reason the, the challenges were not picked up during these review processes. So the, the designs were submitted, it was signed off, it was approved construction, we went through the bidding process and by the time we got to the project implementation, the consultant on the project raised major concerns about um, the designs and that he would not continue on the project because he would not want to put his name on a project that was so badly designed or was so flawed in, in terms of what the requirements were. And so we had to go back to the drawing board. We had to, when we tried to engage the be the, um, the designer, the cost of he was asking to explain his designs was almost more than having to go and redesign the building. So what we had to do, and I must state that this happened before my time, so that is something that I inherited this is not something that happened during my watch um, in terms of, and I'm not saying that it would not have happened under my watch because you, generally people without the skill don't question the work of technical people when, when they hand it over to you. Unfortunately, or fortunately for me, I challenge everything that is sent to me because I need to understand myself what I'm being asked to sign off on. And so I asked a lot of questions about that project, but there were no answers forthcoming. The people who had signed off on the project from the Ministry of Health was no longer in the Ministry of Health. You couldn't get um, answers from people as to how they approved the design, what stages it went through, and how did it get to that. So 
eventually what we have to do is go back to the drawing board and redesign we have completed the process of redesigning and when we completed the process then the contractor who had won the tender decided that he no longer wants to be involved with that project and it is not a local contractor um, because most of our local contractors would not have qualified to execute the project anyway because you would have had to build a similar project and, and that was a project that was valued at about 13 million plus EC dollars. The DVRP is funded by a blend of loan and grant funds from the International Development Association, the Strategic Climate Fund and the European Development Fund, totaling US $76 million. Then there's another component of the project, component two, which tackles the question of vulnerability and resilience from a different perspective, and that's from the perspective of how do we make sure we have the best data and information available to us to plan, smart planning, to make sure that St. Lucia is developed in such a way to reduce, inherently reduce the vulnerability. So it's not just about how we build, but it's also about where we build, for instance, making sure that we're not building in hazard prone areas. It's also about how do we have the best data and information about pending uh, weather hazards. So if we can know a flood event is happening, you know, an hour or two ahead of time or is about to happen, then we can make certain decisions to make sure that people are best able to deal with that event. So the CAF is actually another component of the DVRP. It's one that's actually quite special to me. CAF stands for the Climate Adaptation Financing Facility. And I really love this component of the project because it appreciates and recognizes the fact that the, the job of building resilience to climate change is not just a job for government, it's a job for everybody. And that everybody needs to have access to resources to allow them to adapt and build resilience. So what the Climate Adaptation Financing Facility does is that through the SLDB, it provides very low cost financing to businesses, to farmers, to homeowners, to allow them to implement any measure that they wish to implement to build the resilience of their farm, their business, their home, to the various impacts of climate change. A lot of persons, first of all, they started to take on solar water heaters. Then with the drought, we saw them taking on rainwater tanks and creating their own storage. For the farmers, they came and they were asking for the bigger tanks, 15,000 gallon tanks, which is things that they need because we saw how the drought impacted everyone severely, particularly um, you know, our food security. The St. Lucia Development Bank Climate Adaptation Financing Facility will be offered at interest rates between 4.5 to 7% per annum. This special financing arrangement can also be used to fund drought and disease resistant crops, soil stabilization, greenhouses, retrofitting of roofs and buildings, and the installation of photovoltaic systems which convert sunlight into electricity to power homes and businesses. On November 20th, the Department of Economic Development, in collaboration with the St. Lucia Development Bank, went one step further and launched the Climate Adaptation Financing Facilities Business Recovery Program. Keegan Mayers operates a 4.5-acre farm in the hills of Babono. He specializes in organic produce. In the past year, Mother Nature has assaulted his business on numerous occasions. So last year in particular, we experienced, for the first part of the year, an extreme drought. And for the latter part of the year, we had an overwhelming amount of torrential rain. With his zeals destroyed and his savings drowned in a vicious cycle of mitigating the effects of climate change, mayors approached the St. Lucia Development Bank for funding under the CAF. They understood the plan that we were going with, uh, that they understood the risks and they understood what we had in terms of uh, assets to basically back it. Martin Martin operates Bamboo Springs, a natural unpurified water which is sold to hotels and households. With the tourism industry in a Komoto state due to the COVID-19 pandemic, his operations were severely impacted. Our revenue was, um, was dropped about 
60% due to COVID. The St. Lucia Development Bank offers the CAF business recovery loans at a starting interest rate of 4.5% with a 15% grant component. I saw out of this and then yes, they, they, they're willing to um, give businesses like mine grants or, or loans as for say, to help them to recover from the COVID. And I thought, hey, look, since I'm in that procurement, I, I suit the criteria for uh, applying for the loan I did. I didn't necessarily have all the time to sit down and constantly do my books and, and so forth. So to have an institution that actually understands and is willing to work with you, it, it can understand that the value that you bring and can actually bring value in terms of working with you to develop, you know, the, your, uh, say, application and, and, and business plan so that, you know, you can go ahead through to get a loan and not just, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have enough and shut you down and not give you the advice. That is... I don't, that is, it's profound to actually have that level of support. The SARC is short for the Contingency Emergency Response Component. Um, as the name implies, it was a contingency component within the DVRP that um, would become activated in the, in the face of an emergency. So it, traditionally, we thought of this as some kind of natural um, disaster or natural hazard. But then along came COVID-19. And we see that the impacts of COVID-19 are very similar to the impacts one would have following a natural event, right? In particular, the, the impact that it's had in terms of the, the economy. So we were able to argue that the CERC should be activated in response to COVID-19 and the World Bank, uh, which is responsible for the funding of this um, project, agreed with us. So in April of 2020, we activated the SOC. And what that does is it allows us to uh, provide some flexibility within the portfolio. So we're able to refocus some of the funding for the DBRP to support what became now priority and critical national activities to help St. Lucia respond to COVID-19. It also allowed us to utilize more streamlined um, procurement procedures to get these projects going um, and implemented very quickly. It was through the SOC that we were able to do the work to convert the Victoria Hospital into a dedicated respiratory facility. Um, in terms of support to the health sector through the SOC, we were also able to purchase um, a number of water tanks and distribute them to not just health facilities across St. Lucia but for them to be able to install rainwater harvesting systems. So we were able to support the La Clary health facility in that manner, as well as Soufri Hospital, as well as the Grosselet Pony Clinic. They now all have rainwater harvesting systems to ensure that they have a continuous water supply, especially in the times of COVID when hygiene is paramount. St. Lucia is at risk for natural, man-made and slow onset hazards. The man-made hazards relate to dam collapse, explosions, oil and hazardous material spills, mass casualty, fire and information and communication technology disruptions. When disasters strike, the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, activates the National Emergency Operations Center, the NEOC, where coordination of all disasters is handled with a varied team depending on the nature of the disaster. However, from inception, the NEOC has been functioning with inadequate resources to manage such a mammoth task. So basically what we have is a shell. And it is, it, is, it is functional, but its functionality can be severely increased. When people are in here and the, the, the NEOC is activated, you have issues with getting information. With the support of the World Bank Group, the Disaster Vulnerability Project and the Department of Economic Development, the NEOC will receive the latest in audio-visual equipment and computers, all with CARSIP's fiber-connected internet with a duplicate system from Flow to ensure continuity of service during a disaster. An off-site backup server system has also been provided to ensure seamless continuity. Through the CERC, the NEOC is also being provided logistic support through the procurement of a 4x4 double cab pickup for disaster planning and response. NEMO also received 371 
1,000 gallon size water tanks for shelters and response agencies like the police, the fire and the Bordley Correctional Facility. Nemo also distributed these water tanks to schools, churches, human resource centers and the National Council for Persons with Disabilities. 85 VHF radios and 8 base stations were also procured under the DVRP project to assist the health system and NEMO. Our collaboration with DVRP through the World Bank is that um, there were funds which were identified um, post-Hurricane Thomas for use for disaster purposes. Uh, what we found out uh, last year was that the funds were not used as yet. So therefore, we, we sat, we met together as a team and decided what were the needs of the NEOC and NEMO as a whole. In addition to upgrading equipment at the NEOC, through the DVRP Contingent Emergency Response Component, Work will be done to design and build a comprehensive disaster information management system in order to enhance NEMO's ability to collect, store, access and analyze data. This will ultimately enable NEMO to better fulfill its mandate and support data-driven comprehensive disaster management. The DVRP funding will also be used for critical capacity building and training. So one of the training that we're going to do is the community emergency response training. And so we're going to make teams available to the various communities and bring some of the capabilities at the NASA level to the community level. So we're going to train some of the community members in local, in some search and rescue, fire suppression, and medical attention. So those are things that they can do at their community. So they're able to now assist themselves so we're going to do damage assessment. One of the first things you need to know after an event has happened is what damage has that event caused. And you need to have it in a standardized form and how do you go out and collect that data. So we're going to train community persons to be able to go out and do some damage assessment and to be able to see what the event has done, what the needs of the community is, and so that they can give us some, some better perspective so we don't if a community does not need something, we should not be sending it to them. Unsolicited donations are the worst because it really and truly, it impedes what you're trying to do. You really want to know from the community what has happened to them and what is it that they need. So you at the national level can make the resource available to them. So part of that is, so the second part of the training is the, dam uh, the damage assessment. The third part of the training is the mass casualty management, which looks at medical interventions when something has happened. So you have uh, a lot of casualties. How do you treat wounds? How you, how you take care of persons initially before, again, before the national system can get there. Tying all these investments together under the DVRP is an ongoing, in-depth review of NEMO structure, operations and services to ensure they are enhanced and streamlined to support better comprehensive disaster management in St. Lucia. Approximately 1 million US dollars was allocated by the World Bank through the DVRP to the National Emergency Management Organization. We've all seen them. Broken pipes, busted mains, overflowing drains of fresh water, precious natural resources wasted. Non-revenue water is water that has been produced and is lost before it reaches the customer. This may be due to illegal connections, misuse of fire hydrants, vandalized or bypassed consumption meters, corrupt practices of meter readers, and breaks in Wasco's intake and distribution lines. The non-revenue water situation was causing Wasco to lose more water than it supplies to consumers. As most people would know that Wasco system is old and aging, you do not know what exactly the demand is. A lot of the non-revenue water figures say we are at 55%. So it's basically saying that you're losing 55% of the water that you're producing 
and that's 55, well, it'll be more than 55% of our revenue. Um, if you know what you're producing, which areas the demand are, what's necessary, because some places we send too much water, some places we don't send enough water. The DVRP has responded to Wasco's need for an acute reduction in non-revenue water. 1.1 million EC dollars of funding was provided through the World Bank to procure and install special meters that would allow Wasco to better monitor the supply of water in their distribution system. We have two aspects of the meterization. You have the meterization on the consumer end, the consumption end, and you have the meterization on the distribution end, which includes um, treatment and abstraction. There's some aspects of the the meterization on the, the treatment and abstraction point where we consume, we burn energy in terms of electricity um, through pumping. And if you abstract water and you pay to you pay or energy, you consume energy to produce and treat that water, you get, um, you need to account for that um, revenue. With the new thrust towards significant reduction in non-revenue water, Wasco has divided its distribution system into a series of smaller subsystems or district metered areas for which non-revenue water can be calculated individually. These smaller district meter areas are hydraulically isolated so that the volume of water within each area can be calculated. These new meters serve one other vital role. This is the chemical room used for the dosage. Uh, these are the two meters that come in on the tee off or the split off from the main 8 inch line and you have two meters that each goes to two different separate chambers for treatment. Wasco produces approximately 13.6 million gallons of water per day. Of that, 7.4 million gallons were being lost daily, thus severely and negatively impacting the company's efficiency and by extension, the cost of water to the final consumer. With assistance from the Climate Investment Fund, the European Union, the World Bank Group and the DVRP, the efficient and sustainable supply of high quality water to commercial, industrial and domestic users at an acceptable pressure with minimal loss through leakages will be a reality for the company with benefits to thousands of households. This $1.1 million investment is also a vivid example of cross-agency collaboration in the pursuit of water conservation, thereby reducing the impacts of droughts and measurably improving our resilience. I have to compliment the staff of the DVRP department and the Ministry of Economic Development who have not stopped work for one day, but have been engaged. We have issued many projects and all of them have gone through the tender process. And those of you who are familiar with this process would know that it's a tedious task to review all of the tenders that come in to get them evaluated. I have to express thanks also to the Central Tenders Board for their role in the process, but we want to place on record our appreciation for the level of commitment that we have seen at the level of the World Bank and the team that works along with us in St. Lucia because without the, the support of the World Bank team, these projects would not have been possible. We have about 19 projects that have been awarded so far. And this is quite an achievement given that um, we have a small complement of staff at the DVRP department, plus um, the persons at the World Bank who are called upon to work extra hours to facilitate us 
So we place on the record our appreciation from the government and people of St. Lucia to the entire world bank team.